Um, so uh, let us uh, let us continue. So today I try to concentrate on one example that will come well completely out of left field. But let me um, just uh, remind you where we stopped last time because uh, we're in a little hurry. So um, we ended talking about networks on a cylinder. So. Um, how to define boundary measurements in this case and uh, how universal uh, Poisson structure on this uh, little uh, connectors made of three edges doesn't really work so you have to introduce so-called spectral uh, parameter. So I'll just uh, draw a very simple example where you may say spectral parameter is not that necessary but we will uh, make it uh, useful a little bit later, so uh, example will be like this. So this will be one side of my cylinder, and this will be well. I don't need to go that far. The other side, and uh, I'll actually number things a little differently. So, well, since it is a cylinder, it will not matter that much, so I'll put sources 1, 2, and then 3 I'll put on the other side. Alright, and then uh, don't want to get confused, so here I'll get 2, 3, and 1. Again, th this is a cylinder, if you want you can twist it in such a way that they, they match, but it's, it's more convenient for me to do it this way. And uh, I will just draw again this horizontal line, so uh, arrows will be going again left to right. And over here I'll put one arrow up, one arrow down. So we agreed that those will be colored. So that's, that's about it. So far there is nothing really that distinguishes this case from from the planner case because I can forget about the other side of the cylinder but I don't want to forget about it so I will introduce uh, this cut right now um, so this is another line it will go this way and then it will come up on the other side of the cylinder Okay, and then I'm going to write the boundary measurement matrix. So I'm going to show you what exactly is going to happen here. For that, I'll need also two weights. I'll just call them X and Y. Okay, so that is the cut. Uh, cut. Uh, well, it can uh, say go, go, go. Well, it, well, let's say it. It goes this way. All right. Uh, so remember the rule is if uh, whenever I intersect an edge with a cut, then I have to put a, a, a spectral parameter in there. And then I want to say that to this thing corresponds a matrix, call it L, of a very simple form. So um, I cannot get from one to one at all. Let's see if I can get from one to two. I can get from 1 to 2, but in an only unique way. Um, I can get from 1 to 3 in two ways, like that and like that. Very simple thing indeed. Then, well, 2 to 1. Well, normally, without a cut, I would say there is only one way to get there, and I would uh, put one there, right? But we have this new rule, whenever I cross the cut, I will multiply by the spectral parameter in the power of the intersection index, which is one in this case. So here I'll put lambda, this is my spectral parameter, it's not a variable, it's just an auxiliary parameter. Well, what else do I have? Two to two. Is there a way to get from 2 to 2? I don't see it. Alright. Well, 2 to 3. There is nothing. 3 to 1. There is nothing. 3 to 2. 
there is one and finally three to three there is one very simple matrix indeed but of course I'm not going to be satisfied with just the simple matrices but uh, remember multiplication is concatenation so even from these simple things you can build a lot of stuff all right so that's an example example of a boundary measurement matrix but then we also have this claim that well first of all boundary measurement matrices are for any network rational functions in weights and lambda and secondly the universal Poisson structure on these little connectors induce an R matrix and that, that will be explained in a second Poisson structure on boundary measurements all right so this this is uh, something that I want to explain you so some of you I'm sure have seen it before so what does it mean so let M of lambda be the boundary measurement matrix well, you can think for a moment that uh, it is a matrix polynomial, right? Just to understand it better. So I want to write down Poisson structure on this thing. So what do I have to do? First of all, this is a matrix, so I need to write Poisson bracket between all matrix and elements. And secondly, this is a matrix of polynomials, so I have to write Poisson bracket between all the coefficients of all the polynomials. And there is a gadget to do this, this is so-called Leningrad formalism, I don't know if I have to call it now St. Petersburg formalism. So what I'm going to write down is uh, a formula which is one of many formulas that, uh, that are often called Sklenian bracket. So uh, it has two sides, so the uh, left-hand side, it's a little unusual if you haven't seen it before, but this is just a notation, it's, not, it, it, it's, it's nothing else. All right, so what does it mean? This is a matrix n by n. This is a matrix n by n. You want to write bracket between all matrix entries, so this should be, the result should be a matrix n square by n square. So it's, uh, well, if I didn't have Poisson bracket, that would be just a tensor product. So this, this, this thing has the same structure. Instead, instead of the product, in each spot, there is a Poisson bracket between M, I, J, say, and M alphabet. All right? But those are also polynomials. So if I want to write Poisson bracket between coefficients of polynomials, it's enough to write Poisson brackets between polynomials themselves with different values of parameters, then you'll get sort of generate, generating function for all, for all the brackets. So this notation just tells you that all the Poisson brackets are encoded there. And now the formula comes on this side, and here there should be something that has the same, well, the same size at the very least. And that is R lambda mu, which I will comment on in a moment, times n lambda tensors n mu. Now this one is a real formula. What you have here is n square by n square rational, well, well, let's say matrix in lambda nu. It is constant. It does not depend on variables. That satisfies 
modified classical Jan Baxter equations. I'm not going to write this. I'm not going to write formula for this. I'm just going to tell you that from this silly bracket on arbitrary networks, that's, that's what you'll get. Why is it important in the theory of integrable systems? Well, so that's an important claim. Excuse me, yeah. can you repeat one more time from what you wish to construct uh, Jan Baxter in this case? From R? R is a solution, is a particular solution of Jan Baxter equation, which just comes out of network. All right. So the important fact is the following. Let's define, uh, well, a polynomial P lambda, let's use Z now, uh, by a formula. So that's just characteristic polynomial of M lambda. Right? So that's going to be a polynomial, well, summation over various coefficients, or various expressions in coefficients involved in M times lambda i zj. So if you set it equal to zero, that's so-called spectral curve, again important in serial integrable systems, but we're not going to get there. But what is most important from the point of view of integrable system is that all i, i, j are in involutions. They all pass on commute. And if everything is generic enough, then they're all independent. And if everything again is generic enough and nice, there is enough of them so that each one of this f w f o o of these uh, functions on my original matrix M define a completely integrable system. And that's that's well known, well studied subject, and that's what we are going to use eventually. All right. So again, we started from some networks, and we got into something that can produce us uh, integrable system. Okay, so I'll keep it here. Yes. So, so this uh, R map is just—is it a rational? It's a trigonometric one. Yeah. All right, and uh, and now for something completely different. So just keep it here. So I want to apply it all to a particular dynamical system, which will be well. In fact, it will be higher, but I will mostly discuss. Pentagram map. Now, uh, I wanted to show you a little cartoon of a pentagram map, but I, I couldn't start a Java class file on this computer. But you'll 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 trust me. It would be a distraction anyway. Yeah. Uh, why can you often get rational arm matrices like this? Is it related to the fact that you chose the torus? It's it's related to to to, to yeah to the fact it, it's somehow built in 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 the structure of how we connect networks together. So you, you can get you get slightly more than just uh, trigonometric R matrix, but really just just trivial deformation. So it's it just this this network is built to to encode trigonometric R matrix. So there is nothing can be done about it. All right. So what is a pentagram map? So this map was. Invented by Richard Schwartz, it was, I think it was about 20, well it was 20 years ago, and I'll just show you definition, it's very easy, so you have a, an n-gon, and you draw the shortest diagonals of this n-gon, and they will intersect, and you'll get another n. So if uh, your polygon, initial polygon, you call it P, then inside you have now a polygon which we'll call T of P, and that's, that's a pentagram map. And so it's very easy to define, and then, well, you want to study what happens if you iterate this uh, transformations. Of course, if you do it just for usual, I find well, polygons, nothing interesting will happen. Everything will collapse into a point. But it's not interesting. So, apply this to projective polygons. And then something interesting will happen. So, I, I 
promised you half, half an exercise, right? Because this is our geometric progression. So, uh, half an exercise is to show that on pentagrams, pentagrams, this map is in fact an identity. So it's called pentagram map, but on pentagrams it doesn't do anything. Right. All right. So. Um, uh, Schwartz started studying this numerically, and that was a cartoon that I wanted you to see, but maybe later. So he just uh, programmed this map to be iterated on a computer. What he what he observed was uh, almost periodic behavior, quasi periodic behavior. So it, it looks like something that should be integral, All right? But for something to be integrable. You need symplectic form, you need integrals of motion, well, at the very least, you need coordinates, right? And so, um, more recently, around 2010, uh, this map was completely analyzed by Sienka, um, Schwartz, Abachnikov, who in particular showed that it is completely integrable. So I want to talk about this just a little bit and then we will put every, this map and its relatives into framework of cluster algebra and network. So it, 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 it was very nice ad hoc work that they did and uh, when I talk about this, I want to say what, what we want to do is bring industrial revolution to this, uh, well, highly skilled artisan work. So we're going to build a machine out of three pieces that will just do all the work for us. All right? Okay, so first, what you need is coordinates. And coordinates, uh, well, there are many ways to do it. So one choice is so-called corner coordinates. So, um, remember we're talking about projective polygons. So let's just pick a vertex. Uh, I'll say I and a couple of its neighbors. So that will be I minus 1, I minus 2, I plus 1, and then I plus 2. Uh, so there are sides of my polygon. Um, actually, before I do that, coordinates, uh, it is convenient, it's more convenient to work with a highly larger space than space of closed polygons. It's convenient, convenient to work on so-called twisted polygons. So what is polygon? Well, Anton talked about this in his first lecture, right? You have several points and the last one should coincide with the first one. And here, well, vertex V, say, N plus I plus 1 is equal to some monodromy applied to a vector describing vertex I, right? So when monodromy is identity, then you have closed polygon. But anyway, this, this construction is local, so what do you do? Uh, you consider this piece of your polygon. How do you find this in general? Matrix M is, uh, well, I use, this is a different M. It's just, just a fixed 3x3 fixed three three matrix. Those are projective polygons in RP. So you have an infinite sequence of points, but, well, they have, they, they, this is almost periodic sequence. Alright? So let's. Um, do this. Extend all the lines that we can. All right. And this way I will obtain several new points. So let me just uh, give them names. So I'll call this vertex A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I define 
y i to be, I'll just write this and then explain a, b, c, d and x, i to be d, e, f, g where this notation x1, x2, x3, x4 is a cross ratio so it's projective equivalent cross ratio of four points on the line and if you well and if you don't remember what that is so let me remind you there's a picture so there are six different cross ratios they're all related the one we use here is um, let me see if I remember uh, all right this one so what does it mean it's 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 a ratio of x3 minus x1 x4 minus x2 divided by x4 minus x1 x3 minus x2 right that's a definition of cross ratio uh, so we work on the complex projective line uh, real projective plane Your points are on one line. Right. Okay? Alright, so this, uh, but I keep making them capital. So xi, yi are coordinates on the space of twisted polygons. And then in this coordinates, you can actually write your pentagram map by a nice uh, rational, birational formulas. So uh, let me put it this way, so pentagram map, if I take T of, well, let me put it this way, xi will go to a new variable which is equal to xi1, xi minus 1, yi minus 1, and here uh, 1 minus xi plus 1, yi plus 1, and then yi star is equal so I'm going to write this formula but I, I'm not claiming that it will be actually important to us but that's the formula alright so that's the map and then there is an invariant symplectic structure which again uh, Avsienko Schwarzenbachnik found by just prior trial and error and I'm only writing down non-zero brackets and then you will see why everyone who was shown this map and who knows about cluster algebra immediately started screaming that it has to well be connected with cluster alright right. now a lot of people were screaming that but no one actually did anything until um, um, Sergei Fomin gave this as a problem to his student Max Glick who wrote a very nice paper and what he did first was the following he considered the change of coordinates um, it's a monomial change of coordinates so Max Glick I'm not going to write what exactly that is again it's not going to be that important to us so monomial change of coordinates to ones that I will call pi qi um, very simple really and then said well the map becomes I'm going to write actually the formulas again and you will wonder why should anybody be so excited about this change of coordinates because it will look more complicated rather than less complicated but you may recognize some familiar gadgets here so I will write it as 1 plus P I minus 2 and then so let me let me do it more carefully 1 plus P I minus 2 1 plus pi plus 1 
pi minus 1, 1 plus pi minus 1, and then pi over 1 plus pi. Alright? Now, it's more complicated formula for the same map. Uh, well, there will be also conditions that the product of all pi's or qi's is equal to 1. So, uh, but if you were listen, listening carefully or watching some, some of the formulas that I wrote on the blackboard in previous lectures, you would be able to recognize some ingredients in this form. We had expressions like that. The old variable is multiplied by expression like that, or expression like that, when we consider transformations of cluster variables, but not the original ones, the ones that we call tau coordinates. So, the change of coordinates actually allows you, so this allows you to rewrite the pentagram map as a composition of cluster transformations for a very special quiver Well, I'm going to call it G3, and I will explain what 3 has to do with it. Now, well, just because one of my programs didn't work today is not going to deter me from using another one, the one that already worked yesterday. So I'm just going to show you that quiver and show what's so nice about that and how this thing works, and then uh, there will be no more slides. All right. So... All right, so that's the quiver. It's, uh, well, first of all, it looks pretty, but that's mostly because I chose pretty colors. But uh, also, it's, it's, it's periodic, right? It's periodic, this is one good thing. It's regular, it has completely the same structure in all the vertices. And it's bipartite, and that's very important. So we have collection of vertices here and collection of vertices there. And it was in each collection, they, did not, they, they are not connected. And uh, what one can easily establish that in this case, if you hit vertices, if you perform transformations at vertices which are not connected, transformations will commute. All right? So what is a pentagram map? Pentagram map is a successful application. Suc yeah, right. It's a sequence of... Uh, it's successful applications of cluster transformations. So you, you just apply them to all the outside vertices, write down the formulas, and this is exactly the formulas you will obtain. But let's see what happens to the quiver itself when you do that. So what happens to the quiver itself is this. So let me just do this one, two, three, four, five, six, what, seven, eight. Well, it is the same quiver almost, right? Uh, the same quiver with all the vertices, uh, all the arrows uh, reverted. Well, but it's very easy to deal with that because our Poisson brackets associated with quiver are multiplicative. So if you want to introduce a minus sign, you just go from variable, say, P to variable 1 over P, and that's exactly the reason for that. All right, I'll switch the roles of Q and P and just uh, turn this quiver around. All right, so one mystery is solved immediately. Why do we have invariant symplectic structure? We don't have to work hard to establish it. It is built in to the quiver. So as soon as you have sequence of transformations that gives you back your old quiver, you have symplectic transformation, right? Okay, so if you have something like that, and now I can turn it off for good. If you have something like that, you can actually try to build a lot of uh, dynamical systems which preserve uh, symplectic structure. You just find a nice enough quiver, a nice enough sequence of transformations. Well, one we saw yesterday when we dealt with the Grossmannian, right? When you do a lot of them and return to the same thing. So in fact, in fact, 
G3 can be generalized to, well, this is what we'll call GK, so I'll just show you the local structure of this new quiver, so you have, well, again, P's and Q's, and quiver will be periodic, but I'll just uh, show one representative part, so you have somewhere far away maybe, one arrow going this way, one go this way, and then here the same story. K represents the integer part of the half of the distance between these two points. Glick's quiver is when, uh, well, those are consecutive. There is also the limiting case when these two arrows will just, just collapse. Uh, all right? So, and then continue this periodically. And then, from this quiver too, you can build in exactly the same way a discrete dynamical system. I'm not going to write the formula. Dynamical system with an invariant symplectic structure. All right, so we sort of solved one piece of the puzzle. I don't need this now. Or one piece of machinery that we need. So, one just a general cluster algebra machinery gives you dynamical system plus invariant symplectic form. All right. But it, it doesn't guarantee integrability at all. And in fact, there are many examples that you, you can build on even smaller rank cluster algebras. I think even in rank two, where you have simple invariant symplectic form, but you cannot provide integrals. So we need, we need more. So the second piece of machinery is the following observation. Quivers GK can be drawn on a torus. Right? And that is important. So the one that you saw can be drawn on a torus. Okay, so why is that important? So I'm going back to this picture now. We saw that when you deal with directed networks, then the Poisson brackets between phase coordinates can be expressed in terms of the dual graph to the network. But what we have already is a graph that describes Poisson brackets, so we have to realize this thing as dual to some network on the torus. Okay? So let's do that, and in fact, I'm going to save some time because I already made some preparations here. Uh, well, I try to you remember this matrix. If not, it's not, not that important because everything else will be formal manipulation. So I'm going to concatenate the thing with similar things. Things of the same structure. Um, now let's do that. Just a few more things. Right, so I want something of exactly the same nature. 
Alright, remember I have the shift in indices, so I'm going to put now things over here. This will be now x1, y1, x2, y2. Alright? That's the second piece. And then I can go on. Uh, oh, sorry, no, I, I don't. It, it, it has to be of the same of the same structure, right? And then, uh, well, what happens to my to my cut? I have to go to extend it as well. And uh, what it's going to do? It's going to where's yellow? All right. It's gonna just wind around. It doesn't have to be a straight cut, right? So it's gonna it's it's on this side actually going to yeah do it this way and then it will cut here and we'll go above and then again it will go up there and so on. Right? So the trick is again, I want to get exactly the same shape of a matrix. So they shift it on the picture, but because there is a shift in indices it will be matrix of the same shape. But then here, if it is crossing three lines, the, the cut instead of one line. Uh, right, so uh, let's see. So then Where should it go? It's not going to go in the same shape. E, right, uh, it has to encircle. Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, it has to go. Yeah, it cuts here. Or maybe it cuts on the other side. You see, I'm. Yeah, it just, just cross two. Right, right, right. And then, then just, just to go parallel. Right, 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 right. And then it, yeah, and gets and gets down on this side and so. But it's already in front. It's already on our right. side, right? Right. Yeah. All right. Well, we can we can do it, right? Okay. So you do that, and then you'll do the same thing again. So next one. So this arrow will have to be now going on the other side of the picture, right? So here it points from 1 to 3, and then here it will point from 1 to 3, so it will go like that. It's on the other side of a cylinder. And then again, uh, right, the other side of a cylinder is here, like that. Then again it will appear uh, on, this, uh, on this side of a cylinder, and so on. So, the idea is you you concatenate the same kinds of pieces, right? You'll get many of them, and so for each piece I had here something that I can now call L1 of lambda, L2 of lambda, and so on, Ln of lambda, where n it will be the number of sides in our polygon, and then from them you construct M of lambda, which will not be as elementary as individual guys here, all right, that's going to be our boundary measurement matrix. What does it have to do with our pentagram map? And now this can be done for. I'm doing this for original pentagram map. Uh, for higher ones, you'll just make more horizontal lines. So that's not not that difficult. Um, so what does it have to do with our pentagram map? So where our old coordinates, which we'll call P I Q I. Well, our cylinder is now. Uh, is now divided into faces again, right? So I can write face coordinates, for example, face coordinates corresponding to this thing will be y1 over x1 according to our rule. So in, inside each square face like this I will put p1 and in the neighboring cell outside I will put, well, or downstairs I will put q1 and here will be p2, q2 and so on. All right? So I realize, again, so I realize my cluster variables pi, qi as phase coordinates here. And then I want to see my pentagram map as being some transformations of natural operations of networks. Right? And natural operations on networks will lead to natural operations on these coordinates. And we had just a couple of elementary operations in the very first lecture. So, let me just remind you of them. Elementary moves 
that we will need here again I will do it symbolically we had this kind of move so remember I'm just showing diagrams but you have to adjust the weights every time you do that right and we can change it into thing like that without changing the local measurement okay? so nothing changes there and we also had elementary moves like this well there were inclined uh, arrows but it doesn't really matter if you have arrow going up and down without changing any weights it's the same thing as just well they commute okay and that doesn't change anything in our boundary response so uh, let's call this type 1 type 2 and we will need something else okay I'll, I want to keep this so what is our what is our pentagram map actually I will need this too actually let me claim that we already built machine number two because we used so we used planner network to associate to cluster data A rational in this case polynomial polynomial matrix all right and then there will be step three all right so uh, what is the nature of pentagram map in this interpretation a perform an elementary move one in all the squares all right so let me just yes forget we remember that this is a cylinder so I'll just I'll just show you what what happens this is what we had well maybe not forget all right this is what we had and then we perform in each of these squares elementary move one what will happen then well arrows will change right so here I'll have arrows pointing the other way here I'll have arrows pointing the other way and here I'll have arrows pointing the other way all right so we did that something changed about the weights about the faces nothing changed so note m of lambda our boundary measurement matrix does not change so there is no dynamics on that end yes yeah uh, yeah, so we need we need yeah we need a few few more things. So uh, B, let's move this arrows around a little bit. So uh, I'm going from this one now to the next step. So this one stays here, and then I'll put those two can be they commute, right? I can put this one here, this one there. Uh, there is also commutation on this side well so a lot of stuff is going on uh, like that uh, well sorry I forgot to change the direction all right and all right what else is there 
shadow. Yeah, there is a shadow guy. Okay. Um, all right. So eventually, what I can do using this, I can I can move this this arrow. Essentially, uh, I can I can move it all the way to that side of the edge. Actually, I better I should have done that. All right, I can move it all the all the way here. So again, nothing changed. Boundary measurements didn't change yet. I'm just well uh, switching around computing computing variables. M lambda does not change. So what am I aiming for? I want to, in the end, to get exactly the same kind of pictures that I had before, but with different ways. So now something uh, reminds me that actually my original quiver was drawn not on a cylinder, but on a torus. And on a torus there is another degree of freedom. I can take edge here and move it around, put it on the other side. So, for example, this guy eventually I can put on the other side. Alright? So, uh, C... Well, move edges around the torus, and then M of lambda does change. So the question is how? So let's see again what happens. When I, when I take an edge from this side of the, of the cylinder and put it on the other side, what do I do? So I have sort of like a sausage, right, and cut, cut a piece here and glue it on the other side. Now, multiplication is concatenation. So what am I doing? I'm doing transformation of the sort AB goes into BA. What do we know about this transformation? It preserves all non-trivial spectral data. So, does change. But M lambda stays within the same conjugacy class. All right? And now we are done. Why? Because, well, we know that all these guys are preserved by the discrete pent by the pentagram map. So we constructed a lot of integrals of motion, of course, normally we would need to do a lot of hard work to check that they're in involution. But we don't have to do any hard work, because we just discovered previously that on boundary measurements my Poisson structure comes from our matrix. And part of the big machinery of our matrices tells me that everything is in involution. Alright, so we just established uh, complete integrability like that. Now, uh, okay, so we had a nice geometric system and we managed to generalize it to something and all of them together turned out to be completely integrable. So I want to just uh, make a few remarks about these higher pentagram maps. Uh, maybe they have also nice geometric interpretation because we started with polygons, we want to get back to polygons, yes. So when you focus on a torus, does the, the M of lambda become no, no, well, uh, to, to compute M of, so uh, l l let me do it again. So you put you put your um, you put your uh, quiver on a torus. You draw a dual map, a dual uh, network. To find M of lambda, you cut the torus somewhere. It doesn't really matter. You, you have a cylinder that gives you a rational matrix function. In fact, you can, you can compute dual lux, lux, represent, dual, uh, lux representation, if you know about the integrable system, by exchanging the roles of the, the horizontal cut and, and vertical cut, so you'll have a larger matrix than that. All right? So it, it doesn't become a limit, but this is a good question because, well, people really should look at what happens to these networks on, on uh, high genus surfaces, and it's not, not clear yet. All right, so um, where should I go here? We don't really need this formula. So is there a nice geometric interpretation of this higher pentagram map? Um, so higher pentagram 
maps can be described in terms of a map on now this this will sound weird but I'll have to say it so corrugated and then twisted uh, polygons right well one of the excuses is that normal polygons are already corrugated. So what, what, what does corrugated mean? So uh, we need some things to be able to, 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 to intersect, right? So um, a polygon in RPK is corrugated if for every I vertices vi, vi plus one, vk, uh, VA, vi plus k, vi plus k plus one are in the same plane. Right? So you have one side and then far away you have another side and they lie in the same plane and that allows us to join them, well crisscross the things and then that makes a consecutive k diagonals intersect and then you define a map on polygons the same way as the original pentagram map T. Alright? So there is a nice interpretation. In particular, if you started in, in, in things which are already planar, then we just discovered that higher diagonal pentagram map, this was a question that wasn't actually uh, Schwartz uh, a, lot, a long time, I actually integrable as well. There is subtlety there because if you take longer diagonals but not consecutive, it's not integrable. It's, it behaves chaotically, so it's, it's, it's a subtle thing. Um, Alright, so that's uh, one connection to integrable systems and so as everyone before me I, I'll, I have to now mention what's going on at least in this part of the cluster algebra community. So there are many connections and I just want to list them. Oh. Well, it's too late anyway. Most of us would probably Google video and pull us on and find it there. Okay. So, other connections with integrable systems well uh, most of the systems actually that I'm going to name uh, come from a series of uh, representations of quantum groups so when you try to apply best ends odds you have to solve certain equations sometimes they're exactly solvable so the rock U systems that can be realized in terms of cluster algebra and this was done in many nice papers by Di Francesco and Kidem. There are Y, T and so on systems. So one of the first successes of cluster algebra was to show, to, to prove the logical conjecture about periodicity for Y systems, and that was done by uh, Fomin and Zelewinski in one of the initial papers, but recently there were many nice work by, uh, in various combinations, Nakanishi, Inoue, Keller, and others. One of the byproducts, uh, they found a lot of new uh, quantum and classical dialogarithm identities just from cluster algebras. But technology is the same. You have a nice quiver, nice sequence of operations, you have your dynamical system you can study. Now, related to this one, 
is a work that we did on uh, Backlund Darboux transformations for um, Coxter Toda lattices. So, and this is intimately connected to Q systems. Um, there is a work on symplectic uh, features of SOMOS-like uh, recursive sequences. So for those, I know there are people here interested uh, in computer science, so you can describe those as a symplectic form preserving system, and this was done by 4D and Hohn. Uh, there is a recent work on cluster integrable systems by, uh, and the relations with dimers by Goncharov and Kenyon. And finally, there is one thing I really like to mention because it is related to networks in the disk. So, um, Soliton solutions of KP and its interaction with totally positive Rasmanians. That's work by Kadama and William. So I'll just say a few words without writing anything and then, and then I'll stop there. So, uh, KP is a nonlinear wave equation. So some of solutions of KP are soliton solutions. They can be described as rational functions and exponentials, and they can be nicely parameterized by elements of the finite dimensional Grassmannian. Now, totally positive Grassmannian is, a, well, elements of Grassmannians where all the Plucker coordinates can be made simultaneously non negative. And it stratifies into nice. Uh, strata which can be described by diagrams of the kind that, that I've shown. So what happens actually is that there are in, in nature solitons that essentially produces diagrams for you. So you, you, can, you, can, you can find a wave it's soliton waves, so there are many, many waves actually interacting. When they interact, you also have the, the cusp of the, of the whale, right? So you'll see, sort of, you look from above, you'll, you'll, you'll see the top of the waves forming a nice picture. So all the minimal networks associated with totally non-negative cells can be actually seen in, a sh seen in a shallow water. You can get exactly Postnikov's picture. So Yuji Kadama, whenever he goes through Detroit airport, they have this very shallow fountain. So he can be caught just trying to make, make literally make waves there to see solid on interactions. All right, so I guess I will stop here. This is the last lecture of the school, so I have a duty and also a pleasure to thank organizers for their hard work.